Okay, welcome. So, welcome to the second podcast. Um, today, I have James Bogue here. Have that pronounced that right? Yeah, yeah. James Bogue. Um, yeah. And today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the archetypes, but more from the Indian perspective. So, a little bit about James. James is a Sanskrit scholar and teaches applied yoga philosophy and mythology around the world. Drawing on his background in languages and scriptural teachings, he brings the practical essence of traditional Indian teachings into the vivid context of our human lives today. He's been teaching yoga since 1993. No, no. I've been teaching since 1993. Teaching yoga since 2004. Ah, okay. So he's been teaching since uh, 2004 yoga and leading Kirtan since 2003. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Welcome, James. Really Thank you. Good yeah. To have you here, brother. So, as I was just sharing before, so the idea with these podcasts is, you know, I'm seeing that um, with the changes, with what's happening with COVID 19, um, really wanting to support men. And I see that, you know, whatever tools, practices, wisdom from many different traditions, whatever way, you know, I can share, others can share, then this is what I'm really wanting to bring into the world at the moment. And that's kind of why I've asked you. And, you know, we obviously were speaking last week. And I feel very excited. So thank you for joining, James. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So the first thing I'd really want to, to talk about is just uh, if you'd like to share a little bit about your own journey, this um, what got you interested in the Vedic scriptures and yoga? Um, okay, great. <laughs> so this is a, you know, the, the story could be told in many versions at many lengths, but very briefly, I would say I would say that from a young age, I guess I had a certain spiritual inclination, and this was. I would say amplified by experiences I had playing sports and getting into a state, an absorbed state, a flow state, which later I would find there are plenty of ways of describing this in the yoga tradition, a state of samadhi of integrated awareness. And in these moments of complete integration, I experienced a blissfulness, a, a joy, and a sense, you know, something beyond the ordinary day to day. And so it kind of brought into my lived realm of experience a reality that, yeah, there is something more than this that I experience all the time on the day-to-day -day level. Um, and when I was a boy, I also, um, I used to go to church when I, was a, when I was like a teenager and I enjoyed the music and I also enjoyed the space, um, the quiet that that, um, that brought into my life. When I was a teenager on a Sunday, at a certain point, you know, I might go to church in the morning and carry the cross down the, uh, down the center of the church in the service, and then go and practice basketball in the afternoon, and then come back to my room and try to I would do all these stretching exercises that my basketball coach had taught me and she told us had come from yoga and these deep breathing exercises. And I would sometimes try to meditate and I thought I couldn't because I couldn't manage to empty my mind. And then in the evening I would go and play basketball again, but I, this would be with, with other people, with the team or other friends. So the afternoon session would be like a personal practice. So the whole Sunday was this kind of like a ritual. <laughs> And my basketball coach basically gave me a practice when I was like 12 or 13. And this became a daily practice. There were things I did. And so from a young age, I had this support of a daily practice to kind of check in and help cleanse my awareness, help brain, brainwash myself in a good way in terms of clear out the detritus, clear out the negativity and get into the present and concentrate and enjoy being in the present because I'm there with my body and my senses and my mental acuity all invited into the present moment. 
And so when I was a bit older as a teenager, I, I had this, let's say I had some, you might call it transcendent experiences playing sports. And just beautiful experiences, sometimes dancing as well. But when you just that experience, when you really get into something and it's like, wow, oh, this is, this is what it like. This is amazing to feel alive like this. And I, I also, a real, there was also a, a strong sense of the, the beauty of life and the beauty of nature and the wonder of existence. Um, but when I was a bit old as a teenager, I, I realized I, I, I just felt I can't go to church anymore because I went to a church of England and we said the, the Nicene Creed in which it says, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And I said, well, I just, for me personally, I can't say that because I felt like if I've been born in, I've been born in the Far East, I might be Buddhist. Or if I've been born in the Near East, I might be a Muslim. If I've been born in wherever, I might have a different take on it. And when I'd done religious education at school, age 11, 12, the thing that really struck me was like, at the core, these traditions are all suggesting and advocating the same principles of basically be a good person, <laughs> honor yourself, honor the other, the other person, the other species, the planet. And can you move through the world in such a way that you move with grace and you leave it maybe even better than you found it and you honor these amazing gifts of nature? So to me, that was the message that all of the major world religions seem to have at their very core. And so this idea of one religion, I just had trouble with it. And then at university, I studied French and Italian. And there was one particular Italian course in which three, I read three life-changing books on this course. I was 19 years old. And one of them was Primo Levi's If This Is A Man. So Primo Levi was an Italian Jew who survived Auschwitz and he wrote a lot of books. And the first one was called If This Is A Man in which he, you know, he, he tells what happened when he was in, in the lager, in the death camp. And there's one episode in particular where he describes this situation. So he's in a, in a dormitory with lots of other prisoners and they're all lining up to go into the, the dorm at the, you know, and it's in the, maybe already the evening or the night time. And basically there's a selection the prison officers are sending some people off and everybody knows what's happening. They're going to go to their death. And then those who are not selected to be exterminated, to be murdered, they go into the dawn. And Levy describes this scene in which the, one of the people just adjacent to him, above or below or next to him, is saying a prayer and thanking God that he has been spared. And Levy asks the question, what God is he thanking to have spared him while he's allowed all, his brother, all of these brothers and sisters of him to be slaughtered in this way? And so it really raises the question of like, well, for me, at that, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a human being? And what is God? And if I'm praying to God, as I did as, as a child and as, as I had felt, what, what God do I want to connect to? And what does it mean to be a human being? And so this book had a very um, powerful impact on I me. Mean, it really made me ask the question, well, would I be a concentration camp officer? And how can I ensure that I wouldn't be? And what does it mean to be fully human? And I think, Already since I was, since years before that, at school, for example, I, I had a, I didn't, you know, if authority that was wielded without the embodied virtue that made it feel reasonable was always a problem for me. Mm. Like if somebody suggested a way of being and they were embodying the virtue that made me, that made it convincing, I was happy to, to join. <laughs> but if someone was trying to impose something that just seemed um, because they were just going on with the rules or just lazily following protocols, it utterly disgusted me. So, for example, in the basketball team I was involved in, there was a very strong ethos 
when we were training, this time was sacred. So time wasting was not tolerated. But I happily went along with that because I could see this is everybody's being very respectful. And the older senior players, they were inviting us younger ones to really value and make the most of the, this precious time to learn and grow together and enjoy together. But if I saw somebody like bullying a younger person just because they were not following the rules without making it clear to them, it just disgusted me. So for me, I think when I encountered that, the thing that it really brought me into sharp awareness of was the thing that makes us human is our conscience. And to heed conscience is the mark of a true human being. And then when I encountered the yoga tradition, which I encountered in a quite un particular way, so I've been getting into physical yoga practices. And then quite early, just a couple of years into my yoga journey, I'd been reading a bit, but then I went on this weekend trip. <laughs> I was teaching at university in Bangkok at the time. So I was living in the city and most weekends I would be marking my students' essays. But this one weekend, uh, I, I got wind that there was this trip out of town and I knew oh, that weekend I don't have essays to mark. So I went on this trip and the first evening I met the man who became a meditation teacher, who was a direct student of a great Kashmiri master called Swami Laxmanju. And he gave a talk on yoga from the point of view of Kashmir Shaivism. And Larry, that's the teacher's name, he said, well, years later, he said, well, I always remember you, James, because your jaw was in your lap. It was like, oh, wow, this was it's like, this feels like home. And then I started to study yoga. And the more I studied it, I, I realized that this is, this is what yoga is about. It's about learning to align with conscience. It's about cultivating the courage, real, what I think is real courage, which for me, courage means to have the, the strength and the presence to stand true to what our conscience, our heart and soul feels and knows is the appropriate thing, even if the rest of the society is flooding in the opposite direction. And this is one of the primary qualities that the yoga method says we need to cultivate in order to practice, along with self-trust or sovereignty. A faith, but that's not a faith about believing in something that somebody tells us or we've read about, but the faith that comes from putting things to the test honestly, in the arena of our own experience. And so for me, this was a spirituality that was super practical. And I was so fortunate that the teachers I initially encountered had this background and this decades of authentic practice, that they could communicate that in a way that I realized wasn't that, it was really a really amazing gift that that came to be at that time. Um, and then that really sparked my interest to go deeper. So when I first started studying with Larry, I'd already been reading a little bit of yoga text. And I'd looked at the Yoga Sutra in translation and it didn't, didn't make so much sense to me. Uh, and then when Larry spoke about the Yoga Sutra, the Bhagavad Gita, they just came so alive. And that then made me want to study Sanskrit because I'd studied a lot of before and I knew even if you translate like French and Italian was my degree. If I translate from English to French or English to Italian, these languages are close, but like one of my other favorite books that I also encountered on that same course, I read it in Italian, I read it in translation. Those are two of my favorite books. <laughs> it's the same book in the original the translation, but somehow it's different. The flavor is so different. And so I knew, wow, even from two European languages, I'm not going to get the same experience through a translation. I, know that, I knew enough to know that Sanskrit is this whole other realm. And so then I was teaching at a university where they had a Sanskrit department. And so I approached one of the faculty. One of my colleagues in the English department was very instrumental in this, Bill, who was a retired U.S. Marine captain who, after the horrors of Vietnam, had found, I think salvation is an appropriate word through the study of philosophy. And he was also, we were colleagues in the English department and he'd been studying Sanskrit for some years. He's just finished his Bhagavad Gita translation after 20 years working on it with, with our first teacher. Mm -hmm. He knows like he'd, he'd studied many wisdom traditions in many languages. 
but Bill introduced me to Ajahn Tassini, this wonderfully gracious and beautiful, beautiful teacher. She'd already been teaching for many, many decades at that point. And she agreed to, to take me on. So I was studying yoga philosophy with Larry and I was doing Hatha yoga and meditating. And then I started studying Sanskrit with Ajahn Tassini. And then after a few years, then I went, I left, well, I left the university, <laughs> taught yoga full time for a while. And then I went to India to, to kind of continue my Sanskrit investigations. But specifically for the point of getting deeper access and carving a more personal, intimate relationship with these vibrant living yoga texts that have got such practical wisdom encoded in them. So, and I went to India and um, had the chance to, to study with Sanskrit pundits there. And I was also very fortunate because the, the main, my main teacher um, was a person who, because you know, you can meet Sanskrit pundits who were amazing Sanskritists. But the lovely thing about my main teacher was that he and his father are also practitioners in their own way. So they, they have, they were interested in my soul <laughs> as well as me learning, uh, you know, learning more about Sanskrit as a language. They, for them, the whole point of Sanskrit literally means well-made. And there is a, there is a whole yoga of Sanskrit, of Sanskrit. The idea is that, the study of that grammar is a means to help clarify the lenses of our awareness. Mm. So for them, they're also, they're, they're logicians. They've been father to son, acharyas, which means teachers of logic for going back hundreds of years. Um, but for them, the whole point of any study is to make it yoga, to, to, to find out more about who we really are and to connect more to to the bigger picture, to, to the divine, to God, if you like. That's, that's the language they would use anyway, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds an amazing story. I'd not heard this story before, so thank you for sharing. Most welcome, Chris, yes. <laughs> so I guess, so I kind of have a set of questions. I mean, what comes up for me as you speak this is in your opinion, do you feel that we've lost that connection that we're seeing things clearly as a society? Obviously yoga is teaching what you're saying about clarifying this lens yeah. to find out who we really are. Do you see that we are seeing who we truly are, especially for, you know, the, the man in the West? Do you feel we are seeing ourselves as we are? Um, well, I would, I've never been asked a question quite like that before, because but the thing that I have to say is like yoga begins that there are two qualifications or prerequisites for yoga in the tradition. One is to be born. Okay, I can tick that box. Yeah. The second is to know that I'm not in the state of yoga, or in other words, to know that I don't know. Mm. So in the Upanishads, which is one section of the Indian traditional literature, which in which, in which yoga or connecting more to who we really are is a key theme. Yeah. They say, those who think they know, know nothing. <laughs> yeah. Those who know they don't know, at least know something. Because once we know we don't know, then we're open to learn. Yeah, okay. And so it's absolutely foundational in the yoga tradition. This is one of the reasons, there's so many reasons why I find it so beautiful, is that in yoga, we're constantly reminded we have to keep inquiring. We have to keep examining our biases. We have to keep asking, well, where am I in this? <laughs> so I'm having a beautiful experience. Where am I in this? I'm having a difficult experience. Where am I in this? What's the truth here really? So these questions, where am I in this? This is my friend Bill's question, the, the US Marine captain. Like, what's really going on here? And what's the truth here really? This is a question that an American teacher called Eric Schiffman likes to ask himself. But these are just they're straight from the yogic uh, teachings. And it's really foundational to, like, I think, for example, Piers, you also grew up in England, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I was at infant school, I learned some foundational teachings of yoga when I was taught the Green Cross Code. <laughs> stop localism. <laughs> stop, not in the sense to try to stop life, 
Because yoga recognizes life is dynamic. Everything's always moving. We're part of nature. And what is nature? It's that which is born. Mm. What do we know about nature? Everything that's born is going to die. Mm. And in between those two great changes, the only thing we can guarantee is change. Mm. But yoga recognizes that also, as well as change, everything has an essence. Everything that exists has an essence. But because it's in nature, it's changing. But it also has what's known as tamas, this quality of inertia. Mm. So once something's established, it's more likely to continue in that form than to change. So everything in existence, once it's taken the first step, it has some inertia. Mm. So as human beings, because we're adapting to a constantly changing environment, and because we have this amazing capacity for homeostasis, Sometimes we can get a little bit negligent because in many instances, it's very helpful not to have to pay close attention to everything because there's too much to pay close attention to. So one of the real disciplines of yoga is to cultivate the light of centered awareness. So to use all the powers of our awareness to really check, how do I want to respond to this particular situation? So to stop, to pause long enough to check, am I just running on autopilot here? Or am I giving myself enough space to heed the input of my conscience? So to stop, look and listen. So in the Green Cross Code, they say, look, look both ways. <laughs> but don't just look the habitual way. Can you also look in ways that reach beyond our habitual ways of looking? And to me, this is the foundational yoga practice, to look in ways that reach beyond our habitual ways of looking. Mm -hmm. Is that easy? <laughs> no, <laughs> that requires not only, it requires commitment, it requires presence, but it also requires courage because our habitual ways of looking in some instances are protecting us from those things that we have preferred to keep confined to the shadow lines. Mm -hmm. So as we make a practice of stopping looking and listening and we look more deeply and we invite ourselves to look in ways that we wouldn't ordinarily entertain. And we make the effort to hold differing perspectives and acknowledge different points of view and really check, well, mm, what's really going on here? This invites us into a broader perspective. And then to listen. Now, when we, have, we hear listen in the yoga tradition, there's the idea that our five sense powers of listening and feeling and seeing and tasting and smelling the hearing capacity is like the head of that group so when we have the instruction shrinu in sanskrit listen it means listen with all of your senses so can i pause enough whenever i'm making a, a significant decision in life can i just check in can i find the courage and the presence to check in with my conscience and just check I'm not rolling on the autopilot that might be based on obsolete habits, on obsolete information, or prejudices that actually I'm ready to leave behind and step forwards into a broader, more inclusive perspective. And this is where the Bhagavad Gita, this amazing, amazing text of the old tradition, is set. So it's set on a battlefield. And the student, whose name is Arjuna, he's a very seasoned and uh, mighty warrior. And normally when he goes to fight, he's very happy. He's, that's his art. You know, he's a great archer. And this is what he's trained for. Normally when he goes to battle, he's relishing it. But this day, he goes to the battlefield and he sees all around, on both sides of the battlefield, people who are dear to him, family members, teachers. And then he feels, he turns to his friend and teacher, Krishna, and says, I cannot fight. He, but very significantly, he pauses, he becomes quiet, and then he says he will not fight. He doesn't see what good can possibly come of this. So he's in a situation where basically the rules that he has lived by up to that point are no longer vast or inclusive or robust enough to help him meet the situation he finds himself in, in good conscience. And he has the courage to stop and own and acknowledge that he does not know. 
and he has his friend Krishna. Krishna literally means black or dark. So he looks, so symbolically we could say he has the courage to stop and look into the cave of his heart and inquire with his conscience, what do I need to do here? And his conscience, Krishna, urges him to get up and stand up and face those tendencies which are no longer serving him. So they are personified as his teachers and his cousins. His cousins, they are, let's say, the tendencies within him that would lead him into greater bondage and limitation. They grew up together, they, they grew up in the same field. And his teachers, they are the things that helped him become who he is now. But Krishna tells him, you will honor your teachers by embodying the virtue they taught you, which in this instance means to go beyond what they taught you. <laughs> so um, this idea of stop, look, listen, I think yoga recognizes it's, it's completely normal for us as human beings to get um, identified with limited localized ideas. Because the very body that we exist in and experience through is made of the changing stuff of nature. And so it's completely normal that we get identified with change and limitation. But if we can muster the courage to invite all of the amazing instrumental powers of this bodily vehicle to come into cohesion, yoga, togetherness, joined up state, if we invite the powers of our senses and our action capacities and the powers of our intellect and our emotions and our awareness to come together as one, we can get into this state of being more connected, more integrated. And we can be a little bit, we can respond more skillfully in that balanced state. So in the Gita, Krishna, the teacher describes yoga as evenness, integration and skillfulness. When we're integrated, we can act more skillfully. When we're integrated, we make more discerning choices. But when we get disintegrated, <laughs> then often we make very poor choices and we forget the lessons we've learned. It's like we lose connection with our accrued wisdom. So this idea of stopping, looking and listening, yoga recognizes it's quite normal for us to lose sight of all that we really are. But that doesn't mean we can't do something about it. And the fact that we lose sight is actually the opportunity to come to fuller understanding. Mm -hmm. So in yoga, the fact that we may be blind or have blind spots is nothing to cry about. It's something to be celebrated because ah, once I've noticed that, I'm empowered to do something about it. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So what I'm hearing is these are potentially practices that people could use in these times because I feel some people are struggling or maybe they don't have that they've lost that consciousness and they're looking externally and could this be something people could do as men you know stop look and listen yeah definitely i mean the thing one of the things that i i find you know in yoga i have some friends who uh, work in the nhs and a couple of people in particular um whose aim the reason they went into medicine was because they wanted to be able to make yoga and allied practices and methods available free at the point of need on the NHS. And they, they, they say, well, you know, the thing is, the strange thing is you need to have the peer review empirically tested data to show that it works. Mm. But the thing about yoga is it was peer review empirically tested for thousands of years before it was encoded in the forms that it was encoded in 2000 plus years ago. So the yoga sutra text, for example, the sutra means stitch. It's this very, very distilled form of Sanskrit literature. This is the distillation of a body of teaching that was thoroughly tested and tried for many, many, many generations before it was distilled in that form. So the teachings of yoga, they work. They're what's known in Sanskrit as Purana. Now Purana means many different things, but it means perennial. They're perennially valid. They've been around for thousands of years. They've survived because they work. <laughs> and so they invite us to look in ways that reach beyond their habitual ways of looking. And they give us lots of mechanisms to do that. So what yoga, the, one of the reasons that yoga works is because 
it works with human nature. So what do we want as human beings? We want to feel good, yeah? So there's this beautiful Sanskrit proverb. It says, Manasye kam vachasye kam, karmanye kam, mahatmana. Manasyanyat vachasyanyat, karmanyanyat, duratmana. So it said, so a person, a human being, whose mind, whose speech and action are all one, how does that feel, Piers, when your thought, your word, and your deed are all completely aligned and you're in a state of integration and oneness? How does it feel? Mm. Yeah, I feel very heart centered still. You feel, and would you say you feel good, expansive? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's like that, yeah, that just conscious, consciousness. Yeah. So you've got access to, you've got access to more resources. You feel, so they say Mahatma, that is a great soul. In the sense that is a soul that is expansive, that can access more of its true resources. But the person whose thoughts are in one place, whose words are saying something else, and whose actions are something else again. Bhuratmana, that's a soul in torment. Would you agree, Piers? If sometimes, you know, yeah. You, yeah. So if we're not integrated, we do feel torn. We do feel troubled. Mm. And so the idea in yoga is, let me invite myself into a state of congruence. Don't need to force it. Yoga is very practical. So it doesn't say don't. <laughs> It says, it invites us. Mm -hmm. So the idea in yoga is I invite myself into a state of cohesion as best as I can. Now, when I invite a state of cohesion, it feels great. So what do I want as a human being? Beginning with M and having four letters. <laughs> I want more, yeah. But what happens, the thing that happens, once I invite myself into a state of balance and cohesion, like you said, Piers, you feel a sense of stillness, you feel a sense of calm, you feel a sense of togetherness. So in the tradition, they use this image. When we invite cohesion, when we invite yoga, this balance, this integration, this togetherness, it's like our awareness begins to be get a little bit still, begin, it becomes more settled. So they use an image of a lake or a body of water. Ordinarily, when we're busy, 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 tending to all the different concerns of life, the surface level of our awareness is really busy, so it's like there's wind on the water. Mm. So if we look at the surface of the water, how deep can we see? Not deep at all, yeah? Mm. Mm. Now, we invite cohesion. So we could use any technique, there's infinite techniques in the yoga method. But I invite a technique, I use a technique that invites my bodily, sensory, mental, emotional, intellectual powers to cohere, to come together and support deeper presence. Would you like to teach us one now? Yeah, I'll, a, a practice in a second. Yeah, I'll just finish this illustration and then we can do a practice together. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. So when I invite that state of cohesion, it's like what happens to the water? The surface level of the mind stills. So it's like the water becomes almost like glass. So now if I look into the water, I can see a lot deeper, yeah? Potentially, I can see all the way into the deep mystery of my being. <laughs> all the way to the heart, the depth. But perhaps I won't see all the way. I'll just get glimpses of that because as I look, as the water stills, and I'm able to see deeper into my psyche, I see, oh, wow, there's quite a lot of rubbish down there. Mm. Oh, wow, there's a big sub-aqua cave network. And, and look, oh, there's all sorts of horrible things lurking in those caves that I prefer not to look at. And so what happens at the beginning, you know, often, why do people start yoga? I think often the reason is pain. Something troubles us. We have the idea, mm, I'm not experiencing life quite as, richly fully as i could and maybe i can do something about it maybe this yoga business can help and we're right so maybe that pain is something that we know at all levels of our awareness we want to be free from for example you might have a, like oh my shoulder hurts or or i get a little bit too easily triggered by the boss at work and my friend who's been doing that yoga and meditation i notice she's 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 dealing with the boss really well these days she told me this yoga's made a big difference i'm going to try so i go to yoga 
And sure enough, my shoulder feels better. I, I do feel more supple. I do feel a bit more alive in my body. My digestion improves. And I'm also able to digest it more easily when the boss pushes my buttons and not react and respond more skillfully. So how do I feel about yoga now? Oh, I love it. But now this newfound level of clarity and integration I'm experiencing is allowing me to see deeper. I want more of this clarity, more of this balance, more of this wholeness. And so what the system in its deep innate wisdom will now do is bring to the surface the next layer of rubbish or shadowy habit or monster that was previously dwelling down in some recess of my psyche. It's going to bring it up to the surface where I can heal it and harmonize it in the lived reality of every day. <laughs> and that's why I need to have courage and fortitude. So, yeah, yoga is about cultivating peace and sustainable good vibration, sustainable harmony. But that necessitates harmonization. <laughs> so when I pray for peace or I ask for peace or I orient my actions towards peacefulness, I'm actually asking to bring into the surface level of my awareness the tendencies and habits that I have been harboring within me that would block my experience in that peacefulness in a more sustained way. Would you relate that to, say, the archetypes and, say, those shadow elements? For sure, yeah. In that way. Okay. So in the, I mentioned already the Yoga Sutra and the Bhagavad Gita, so two treasured texts in the yoga tradition. The yoga that is encoded in both of them is known as Raja Yoga. And Raja means sovereign. So yoga is about becoming a sovereign being. And in both of these texts, in the yoga tradition, there is the idea you are responsible for your experience. We have no control over what life throws at us, but how we meet it, that's up to us. And so yoga really emphasizes we need to be the sovereign of our own experience. We need to take responsibility for what and how we do. And in order to do this, we will also have to draw on the qualities of a warrior. Now, a warrior in the Indian tradition, there are many beautiful names for a warrior. One is the Kshatriya, which means the one who protects the Kshetra, the field of our awareness. So the principal, um, I was going to say weapon, but it's not really a weapon. The principal attribute of the yogic warrior is this 360 degree equivision this awareness, this alertness, because where will the seasoned enemy who knows we're onto them and we're cleansing them out of the field, where will they, where will they attack from? They're gonna, they wanna ambush us, yeah? They wanna take us when we're vulnerable. So we need to be alert, yeah? Now, another name for a warrior in the Indian tradition is Yoda. <laughs> Yud, the Sanskrit verb, Yud means to fight, but it means to, if we just, this is the thing with some of these texts, if you look at them only in translation, is that the connotations of the English equivalents are very different from the connotation of the original Sanskrit. So Yud, yes, it can be translated as fight, but it means to engage. Mm. So George Lucas, I understand he was a student of Joseph Campbell, who was a student of Sanskrit and all different types of world mythology. So Yoda means a yogic warrior. And if we've seen the original Star Wars, the ones that you know, go back to the 70s and 80s, Yoda, he's a great warrior, but he's, his distinguishing characteristic, I would say, is his calm. He's able to feel a disturbance anywhere in the force, in the whole realm of the galaxy. How? Because he lives in the center, so he's connected to all the parts. He feels the disturbances, but he's not disturbed by them. He's a very established yogin. And how is he able to maintain that degree of calm? Like I remember the second film, The Empire Strikes Back, Empire Strikes Back where Luke is in the swamplands, mm -hmm. undergoing his Jedi training. He's being initiated deeper into the ways of yogic warriorhood with Yoda. And Luke then encounters his own hate and his own capacity for mayhem and violence and perhaps murder when he sees the, the anger that like, possessed his father. Mm -hmm. And he sees this rage. And Yoda, when he's tutoring him through this, Yoda is a little bit, um, he hopes that Luke will be able to rise, 
rise up and do a little bit, you know, get a better, stronger hold on that. But he's not worried. He's not disturbed by that. Why not? Because he's done that work himself. Mm. He's already caught, been into the deep recesses of his own psyche and he's harmonized the field. He's done that work. So when Luke is going through the ringer, Yoda is not frightened by that. He's not worried by that. He knows it's part of the process. And so he holds the steadiness to help the apprentice move to the next level. So the interesting thing for us as men in the world now is that sometimes we have to take responsibility for those moments of shakiness where we're, we're crossing a border, we're going into a deeper level of integration. And so this is why I find the yogic method so helpful and so powerful because it makes clear that when we're doing the work of integrating more, we will go into the pits of despair sometimes. We will have challenging periods. This is part of the deal. It's part of the process. So there's nothing to worry about. But the edge that practice fortifies us. So when I cultivate balance and integration and I calm the surface of my awareness so I can see deeper, that level of calm that I'm now a little bit more attuned to that's bolstered my system. It's prepared me for that next layer of work. But also, as the Star Wars illustration perhaps reminds us, it's also great to have company, <laughs> to have what we call in Sanskrit satsang, other men who are interested in authentically exploring along that path. And also some who've, who've done that work so we can support each other and recognize that when we're going through those challenging times, we can move through it skillfully. We can move through it purposefully and not to get uh, derailed by those periods, but to actually embrace them for the great opportunities they offer. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yes, I do. It kind of hadn't really reflected that with Yoda. I'd recently been reading um, Joseph Campbell's book. Um, yeah. Not the um, hero with a thousand faces, but his biography, the uh, oh, right. hero, the hero's journey. Yeah, and yes, I'm hearing him talk with George Lucas, and I had heard that George Lucas spent quite a bit of time reading that that book. Um, yeah, hero with a thousand faces. So Yoda, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So what I'm hearing is for us as men is really to, you know, we've got this chaos going round and going on around us, but to kind of really come back to that center mm -hmm. and through the practice of doing like the daily physical yoga, because I know in the West, we often understand that yoga is just the physical practice. And yet my understanding is there's many layers to it. So your recommendation for us as men is it just to do the physical yoga practice or are there other arms of the um the yoga practice that we can we can do to help us kind of get that center yeah so good question Pierre. so what i would say is there is no such thing as just physical yoga in the same way there's no such thing as just devotional yoga or just intellectual yoga <laughs> if it's yoga yoga means including all the parts okay so sometimes people talk about so in the Indian system, we use the, they use this model of the field of our being as having these different parts, which includes the five and earth, water, fire, and space. Mm -hmm. Earth, water, fire, and space. So that broke up that last. Second. Yeah. So in the Indian system, they give us this very practical map of the field of our awareness and the basic building blocks of our material field of reality in which we experience are these five elements of earth water fire air, and space and the idea is that if we want to experience yoga then we have to harmonize all of them mm. now the very fact that we are existing in this bodily vehicle is evidence that we already have innate within us a great capacity or yoga because we you know we have an earthy quality oh, yeah, I'm here <laughs> we have a watery quality the blood is flowing and people say we're 70 around percent water mm -hmm. 
we have a fire, we've got an internal combustion engine and a digestive fire. Air's moving in and out of us and we exist in space. You know, at school they told me I was 70% water and then a few years later they said, actually, you're mainly space. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are existing in space with these elements. So if we want to experience yoga, we've got to harmonize the whole of that space, the whole of that field. So in the yoga tradition, they talk about karma yoga, the yoga of action, the yoga of how we do whatever we're doing. This corresponds to earth. Bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion, the yoga of approaching things with reverence. So the realm of our emotional interactions. Hatha yoga, which in which we have the physical practices. Hatha means sun moon. So it's like expansion and contraction. Life is a heartbeat, is a breath cycle. So Hatha yoga works with these natural pulsations of life to bring them into harmony. And this is the element of fire. And then air, the yoga of inquiry, of the intellect, of meditation, of reflection, of contemplation, of questioning, of examining our biases, examining, am I looking in ways that reach beyond my habitual ways of looking? Am I inviting myself to think in ways that I wouldn't previously have imagined? And then all of these together with the path of meditation becomes Raja Yoga, the yoga of the sovereign. So the way I understand it is that if we're practicing yoga, whatever techniques we favor, if it's really yoga, it's going to invite all our resident powers, all the powers that reside within this field to cohere. And the job of the sovereign in the Indian tradition is to look to what is called in Sanskrit loka sangraha, which means the cohesion and well-being of the whole, of all parts of the field of existence. So if I like doing, for example, physical practices, if it's a yoga practice, then yeah, I'm going to be using my bodily intelligence, but I'm also going to be using all my senses. I'm going to be recruiting them to help me be centered. I'm also going to be using a mental focus and perhaps I'm going to be using an emotional focus. So yoga is super practical. So it recognizes everything we do is training. We get good at what we practice. So let's practice how we want to feel. <laughs> so I can practice gratitude. I can practice presence. So I might be doing a physical practice, which is helping energy and information come into greater harmony and balance so that can flow more easily through the field of my being and support more skillful engagement in the day to day. But I couple that with an emotional intent. I join that to sustained, concentrated mental uh, focus. So at the same time, I'm priming my physical vehicle so I can move through the day more steadily, more easily, more spaciously. I'm priming my mental vehicle so I can actually direct my awareness where it serves me. I make myself less susceptible to being distracted by the endless bombardments that the external world will throw at us. I prime my emotional intelligence by attuning myself to gratitude. It's the idea, is it not an amazing thing to be alive? And I wasn't implicit in that. It just came to me, this gift of life. I didn't engineer my birth. It happened to me. How lucky I am to have this amazing gift of a human birth. And when I practice gratitude, there's the idea that I empower myself to navigate challenging situations more skillfully. So inherent in the yoga method is I, I fortify myself. I make myself anti-fragile, I make myself more robust. The basic definition of yoga practice is the cultivation of steadiness. And I cultivate steadiness in, on a long-term, uninterrupted basis with true presence and a spirit of dedication. Now, I can only practice on a long-term, uninterrupted, uninterrupted basis with a spirit of dedication and true presence if I love what I do. So the techniques that we work with they have to be appropriate for us. In the Indian system of health and the long healthy lifespan, Ayurveda, they say anything can be medicine, anything can be poison. It just depends on the situation, the constitution, and the dose. So we have, being a, being a sovereign, we have to take responsibility for that. But if we like doing a physical practice, then one of the things that's kind of Hatha Yoga does is it really helps us, it gives us lots of tools, let's say, to facilitate balance in our physical being. 
But once we get a little bit of an understanding, an experiential understanding of that, we can bring those principles into all types of physical action, all types of movement practice, all types of physical work. Mm. And so then, like, and walking, walking barefoot on the earth is a fantastic Hatha Yoga practice. It's the idea that once we bring the system into more balance, every step will create this lovely movement through the spine. And once the spine starts to move, the spine is like the, in Sanskrit, the Ganga, which is the Sanskrit word for the Ganges River. Mm. The spine is like the Rio Grande, the main river in this field of our body. So when the Ganga flows, the whole field gets irrigated. So Hatha Yoga is about rehabilitating integration through the whole body so energy can flow easily. When we're in a more balanced, integrated state, if we're just walking freely with that gentle rotational movement and the contralateral movement pattern of the opposite hand and leg, arm, arm and leg, excuse me, then every step will nourish the system, tonify the organs. So would you say, I'm realizing time-wise, we've, we've got yeah. about 10 minutes left, and I'm just, because I'm hearing, say, the sovereign, I'm mm. hearing the warrior, yeah. in kind of this movement, Yes. I mean, Bhakti, would you say that's kind of more the lover archetype? Uh, well, I think it's interesting because I think in the terms of the, the movement, we have the Bhakti and we have the, we have the lover and we have the magician. Because mm. I am, I am, I am worshipping nature as I move consciously in my body and interact with the elements within and around me. So I'm, one way you can consider yogic movement practices that do not need to be confined to yoga postures. They could be any type of movement practice, yeah. swimming in the sea, walking in the fields, dancing, laboring in the garden, whatever it might be. Yeah. You can make it a prayer of gratitude and inviting this cohesion through the whole system. So, but this is also the work of the magician because then you're transforming, let's say it's the work in the garden, you're transforming, you're alchemizing work into an expression of love. So Khalil Hibran's, what's his, uh, what is, how does he say? Work is love made visible, yeah? Mm -hmm. So when we use our bodily, sensory, intellectual, emotional gifts with awareness and celebration, seeking to find out more who we really are, seeking to feel what it's like when we bring them all into togetherness, then this becomes at once an alchemical experience and an, ex and an expression of love and, and joy and celebration. So coming back to the idea of, the, yeah, we can do a meditation practice, we can do a singing practice, we can do a movement practice, we can do an intellectual inquiry practice. Mm -hmm. But if it's a yoga practice, it will invite all parts of ourselves into the present moment. And on the same theme, a yoga practice is going to nourish all of those archetypes. It's going to, let's say, strengthen our 360 degree equivision and courage as a warrior. Mm -hmm. It's going to help our farsightedness, our inclusive vision, our steadiness, and our capacity to reconcile and include of the sovereign but it's also going to rehabilitate the gifts of our sense powers and help us enjoy life so we can actually learn more quickly. So tie into the lover and I rehabilitate my gifts as a sensory we mental physical being. We missed the last line being. there again, sorry. No worries. Let's the lover bit. So, the love a bit. So once through practice, when I rehabilitate my sense powers, for example, when I'm eating to really give all my senses the chance to really be present there and be nourished by that meal, mm. or when I'm bathing to really be thankful for the water, just these little insertions of awareness, they're going to help rehabilitate the amazing innate intelligence of my sense powers. And then I will be able to deploy them more easily to transform what might seem like difficult situations into opportunities to prove to myself my own capacity to harmonize things that would seem previously have seemed forbidding. So I, I feel like you, yoga basically means integrating. Mm -hmm. So when I first encountered the men's work and this, these 
architects like this is yoga it's another way of you know i see it through that lens obviously but the aim of yoga is to be a whole human being is to remember all parts of ourselves and bring ourselves into that wholeness that's great in the sum of our parts. Brilliant. Thank you, James. That's a pleasure. <laughs> you can probably do that. That's gone really quickly, actually. I was like, oh, what's the time? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so, in the last few minutes, is it possible to just guide a, a little practice or teach us something that will, the men who are listening to this or the women? can use yeah so i mean i think i i have put recently um on on soundcloud a couple of guided meditations which would be that they're like about 20 25 minutes each so i'll maybe send you the link to that yeah but maybe I'll put it in the bottom of the description of the video so people can then click on that cool thanks Piers. and i'll so i'll send some things that are a little bit longer but just in the case of a few minutes, so things that we can practice day to day to help us stop, look, listen, yeah? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I find really helpful, um, in a recent course on the Bhagavad Gita, one of the students was a lady who worked in the city for many years, in, and she was a project manager. Right. And so she lived, she's an expert in the to-do list. <laughs> and she shared, you know, what, what, she, what she realized, she left that, that uh, job, in the city like more than a decade ago but she and she thought oh now i'm gonna just live my purpose and mission in life and she thought she would just do it with the to-do list in one year and 10 years later she goes no no it's not it's not like that when it comes to living true to your conscience it's always a constant inquiry and she shared this lovely practice that i found so practical it's at the beginning of the day to take a few moments to maybe write a journal and to start by writing your to be list. So how do I want to be today? What energy do I want to experience? What energy do I want to share in the world? So, and you can write it as I am statement. So I am grateful. And then write two, three, four, ten things you're grateful for and why you're grateful and feel that gratitude. And then maybe think, ah, and, and I walk through the day with grace and appreciation for example or there might be some for example i am responsive i take care to check if i am responding in the way that i would really feel is appropriate if this was my last day on earth i would like to make sure that i live this day in a way that i could go towards death feeling well i did my best so one of the ideas of karma yoga there is that everything we do can be yoga yoga practices everything we do all the time so one of the keys to this is to have that i that idea like can i do whatever i'm doing like it's the first time i'm doing it so when i eat the food can i eat it like it was the first time with that sense of wonder and gratitude then i'll notice more and in noticing more i'll start to rehabilitate my sense intelligence so i can actually make myself I can draw on and access and integrate more of my innate intelligence. And then, so making this to be list. And then if we get into a to do list, it's like, well, how am I going to do those things then? So I was like, rather than focus on the to do, I'm focusing on how I want to be and let that be the point of orientation. Thank you. So I'm hearing to do a to be list you know, yeah. writing a journal in the morning i'm hearing being able to walk through the day you know with grace saying yeah. these things and how am i going to do these things what's the energy i'm going to bring to these yeah things, so. and then if we have a practice so let's say you like to do a bit of exercise in the morning or whatever in the day hmm. something that we do as a practice to also use that to practice how we want to be in life, how we want to feel in life. Mm. So if I'm doing like whatever physical practices I, I like, I enjoy, I work with, whether I'm, you know, doing some calisthenics or I'm running up the fell or um, whatever it might be that I like to do, do it as a celebration and do it 
seeking to cultivate what I'm really looking for to support me today. So how can I let this help me bring more balance into my life? How can I do it so I make it its own completion? So this beautiful idea in the yoga of action is to, to make the action its own wholeness by giving ourselves to it but, and so consecrating the action. So rather than focusing on the outcome, rather than being concerned about what might come, rather being weighed down by the expectation I might have of myself based on some past experience or previous trials, I give myself wholly to what I'm doing so I can make it its own fullness. So the idea in yoga is the, let's say, the crowning glory of a life lived in sovereignty is that when the time comes, we can die peacefully, feeling ready and prepared. And how will we do that? by sleeping in peace at the end of every day. And how will we do that? By living each day as the honest, heartfelt expression of our, of our conscience, of our deeper longing. So taking a little bit of time to check in with conscience, how do I wanna, what do I wanna experience today? And then I think it is tremendously valuable to, to, have a, to, to learn a meditation technique, to learn some movement techniques and to find there's so many types of practice, like intellectual inquiry exercises, singing practices. You know, the work I do, I talk about the yoga of the whole human being. <laughs> so we'll move, we'll meditate, we'll inquire, we'll work with story and song, we'll be outside in nature, we'll work with food and the land, and then it's nourishing all parts of ourselves. So the thing I find so wonderfully practical with yoga is it gives us these principles that we can then apply to every part of life because everything's about connection. So how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to the people around us and beyond, how we relate to our environment. And yeah, I mean, the principles are so robust and adaptable. Mm. Well, thank you, James. Thank you so much. So how do people get in touch with you? I'll, I'll obviously put a link to your website in the description below, but yeah. So my website, um, my website has the things that I'm doing on. And in these recent times, I've started doing uh, courses where we gather through zoom with a group, 25 people maximum. So we can, can stay very lively and interactive. And then, I really love to teach immersive programs where we can really live the teachings for a longer period of a week or two. So in recent years, I've usually done that in Spain, uh, but that's not happening this year. So ordinarily, I, for the last 10 years, I've been teaching on the road a lot. Um, last year, I stopped in one place for 75 days, and that was the longest I've been in one place for 10 years. Wow. Um, and now, now here I am in the, where I grew up. Uh, and um, enjoying this stability. So I, I love sharing these courses on the practical yoga texts. Um, but the thing I love even more is when we integrate that with the movement and the meditation and the, these inquiry exercises that can help us link it to everything else we do in life. So I hope to be able to do that and gather again in person soon. But certainly my website is the the place it's not a very flashy website uh, and i have a youtube channel that has quite a lot of resources on it now so okay. if anybody listens to this and wants to find out more there is a particular playlist which is quite recent i made it for you to try to introduce a lot of these foundational ideas in a little bit more detail maybe okay so we'll put that into the description so the youtube channel and your website so it's james bogue uh, yoga.com that's right. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, and hopefully because I'll have my first book out soon. <laughs> yeah. When's that due out, James? Well, I haven't, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a date yet, uh, but okay. not, it's getting closer now. So hopefully we'll be able to give each other a real coffee of how books in person before long. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Well, I'll, um, I'll finish off the recording in a moment. And yeah. then um, maybe we can stay on and, and speak a, a little bit more after that. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and yeah, please do people reach out to James and, um, you know, offer him uh, 
if you've got any questions or want to watch some of his videos or listen to his meditations or reach out to some of his programs i really recommend his work so yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, what it says if if by any chance we do get questions i'd be very happy to, you know, to come on again and we could take up some of those yeah great, great. yeah okay well thank you brother thank you Piers. okay take care